Okay, welcome everyone to today's Power Talk, Rethinking Recruiting for Practitioners. Uh, so very excited to bring this uh, to you. And as everyone uh, joins in, we will, uh, we will kick off and just do some basic intros as uh, everyone is joining us. Um, so my name is Damien uh, Adler. I'm the, uh, one of the co-founders of Power Diary um, and head of uh, the customer success um, team. I'm also a registered psychologist um, in, based in Australia. Uh, and the owner we developed, uh, my wife and I, who's also a psychologist, we uh, developed a, um, a group practice, a group psychology practice many, many years ago. And it was from that sort of experience um, that Power Diary was, was actually born. So, uh, you know, really understanding that the needs and that we had in terms of growing a, um, a allied health business, um, sort of identified lots of things that we really realized were essential to um, doing that in an efficient way. And uh, so long story short, um, partnered with my uh, brother, Paul, uh, who has a very strong um, tech background and uh, we developed uh, Power Diary. So that was uh, many, many uh, years ago. Um, and today for this, uh, for this talk, we have a, a co-presenter with me today. So very pleased to welcome uh, Naomi to uh, the talk today as the uh, co-presenter. And uh, I will hand over to Naomi, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background of uh, uh, who you are and why you're with us here today. Thanks, Damien. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Naomi Crosby Osaki. Um, I am People and Culture Manager here at Power Diary. So, um, reaching up to a year now since I've been um, absolutely flown by. Um, so, I've got a kind of fair amount of background, obviously, in, in human resource management, but um, also in recruitment. Started off my career um, doing recruitment, agency recruitment, actually, in Allied Health in Australia. Um, so I recruited uh, physios, um, OTs, psychologists, um, a bit of nursing on a, on a different side. But um, yeah, uh, hopefully I'll be able to add um, some of my expertise and, and kind of experiences that I've had over the years from, from both the kind of external recruitment side and also um, internal uh, human resources side as well. Wonderful. Thanks for that, Naomi. And of course, Naomi also heads up our recruitment at uh, Power Diary as well. And there are some themes that run through both recruiting in uh, the allied health space and in the tech space as well. So it's uh, Naomi is very well well practiced at um, the, the topic we are here talking about uh, today. Too kind, Amy, and thank you. Um, so yeah, today hopefully um, we'll be able to give you uh, some good insight into hooking the right candidates. And I find finding uh, recruiting is, is almost like the, the same way you would market your practice is that you need to um, market your practice as um, a great place to work as well. Um, and that same kind of mentality, that same uh, commercial marketing mentality almost needs to go into um, finding the right people. Um, so uh, here's some um, statistics um, that we we're, were able to get um, together just about the, the landscape and, and to, to rightly show you that if, if you are struggling in, in recruiting and, and trying to find the right people, there's, there's a, a good reason for it. Like um, the demand is up and they are uh, some of the hardest uh, roles to fill um, within allied health. And um, not just Australia, not just whatever region you are in, like this is, it's a global um, shortage um, of finding the right um, people. So yeah. it's, um, it's a struggle, yeah. <laughs> and it's something where it really was the catalyst for today's uh, topic was because we we're hearing this from our uh, customers all over the world. So, um, you know, UK, US, uh, Canada, um and and australia as well that this is a you know an issue that people are coming up against and, and finding that there is demand for services and often you know a backlog of of, of demand pent-up demand and uh, but growing the team uh is something that people are sort of struggling with and and i think you know there's sometimes a temptation or there's almost a trap you know to kind of focus on money you know just uh 
you know, add more money and more money um, to the offers, um, which makes, you know, quickly makes practices, um, you know, very uh, uneconomical, you know, to, to run and, and can be disheartening, you know, for people. Um, and so really this, you know, part of that, that sort of drive today is to talk about, you know, just positioning your practice in a way that means that you're not kind of relying on um, just trying to outbid each other, um, but, but, you know, have something different. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's something that, you know, hopefully today is going to, uh, you know, just give you some ideas of things that make life easier for you and maybe try something a bit different that um, you might not have done or take away something that will help you uh, in this sort of challenging recruitment environment. Right. Um, and so to, to really, before we can tackle um, the issues, we need to identify them. So there's there's a lot of kind of be, beyond the day to day and, and the, the, the struggles of um, trying to, to grow and um, having a limited population and um, to maintain the growth. There's still other factors. And obviously the past um, two years have, have really mean there's a, an entire working change, um, uh, change to the landscape. So um, things like remote work, that would probably have been unheard of when, when it comes to um, the, the nature of um, health practices are uh, becoming more, more prevalent and, and also easier, I guess, to um, maintain with, with um, changing technologies. Um, so that, that's um, a big thing, uh, people wanting that um, remote work and being able to um, take their um calls from from wherever they are in the world um and um yeah covid um in general the effects on the healthcare industry it, it healthcare it effects on the world but um of course the the healthcare industry um in particular was uh affected strained and um pushed to the limits and um proving the um absolute necessity that the, <laughs> the service is providing to society um People, I guess, when we're talking employee priorities, they had some time to take stock, I guess, and um, being at home, actually being able to spend the time with family, that would possibly never have happened before. Um, I personally, I had a baby in September 2020, and I was, I, I could not, I don't imagine being able to maintain a, a child and um, without my my other half being here, so like he was holding the baby in 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 calls, and I had a five minute sleep. So, um, it's things like that that he was he didn't miss a single thing, and and people don't want to um, miss those things. Um, so they've sort of got used to it, you know, in a way, too, haven't they? They sort of seen a, a seen, um, and a, it was a forced insight into you know, or forced on us, all of us, you know, that everyone had to adapt to a different way of working for a while. But I think you know, having been forced into that situation now, people have kind of become accustomed to it and, and like, you know, the, the the benefits that, you know, that mm -hmm. comes. So, but it makes it tough, doesn't it, in terms of, you know, recruiting, because if um, an organisation isn't able to offer that flexibility or isn't considering that, um, then it makes them less attractive, right, as, a, as, an, a, as an employer or a place to go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, you know, if and when baby number two ever comes along, I'm just like, I've already said there is no way in hell you are leaving me at home alone by myself. So it's not even <laughs> the employee. You've got to think about the other people that are in the house that share that and um, yes. and, and what demands there, there could potentially be. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it really is a mindset. Uh, it's a shift, isn't it, in the way people are thinking about this? Because that thought, what you were just saying then about you know, no way are you leaving me uh, alone, you know. Um, <laughs> if we were to go back, you know, two or, three, or say three years, um, that it would be sort of unrealistic in a way, wouldn't it? You wouldn't think of it in such strong terms that this is a like a deal breaker. Hey, you know, hey, husband, you're not, you're not going, you know, uh, you know, off to work. We, you know, I want you around. Like that's, that wasn't something that I guess was realistic or, or people were an expectation that, that people had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, absolutely, and um, and I think it's yeah, it's 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 opened everyone's eyes up to the possibilities, and um, and it's it's like these hygiene factors that if this is a norm now, you take it away, then what happens? Um, people will get upset. Um, and and yeah, talking about meaningful work, um, I guess it's it's the 
everyone pointing in the right direction and everyone having a connection to what the end result is and um and being uh engaged in that sense and it's it's not just kind of coming to work to do your job it's it's the why you get up um out of bed in the morning and what what inspires people and and, and people yeah you would want that from your day to day yeah. and it has i mean it's always been a sort of uh, something important i think you know in a workplace but um mm-hmm. i think in our you know discussions uh, preparing for you know today's um you know for the for the webinar that really there's been that increased focus on this now hasn't there that this idea of sort of, you know, people have had this time, uh, you know, often at home or they've had a break in their normal flow and and a sort of, it, it's more important for them to have that sense of doing something that makes a difference or that, you know, gets a, a bigger outcome. Um, and I think, you know, in health, it's particularly lucky, you know, to, because we can tap into that quite easily, right? That, that, um, because by the very nature, you know, it's a, an industry where uh, we're helping people. And I know certainly, when we're recruiting into powder, this is one of the one of the things that's you know helpful is that our whole reason for being you know is to help health practices deliver more efficient and better you know service. And so you know we're able to talk about the fact that you know people are working for powder are working in a in a role that makes a meaningful difference you know to the world and to the provision of healthcare. Um, but I think there's often we're not necessarily used to really emphasizing that um, and it seems that that kind of trend post COVID or in the you know as we're coming out of that has been that people are looking for that to the higher priority for them perhaps than it was before which is a good thing I think you know because people should have should do something meaningful right like we only get one life as far as we know so you know it should um yeah it should have that um yeah which is uh yeah which, which is yeah something that you know we need to we need to really kind of be be on top of. Okay, yeah. so if we think about this and the implications, you know, of, of that, we kind of need to update, you know, our hiring mindset. Um, and I think this is where, for some people in particular, the frustration, you know, kicks in, um, in that they have had a particular way. Often they might be quite experienced in, you know, in their business. They've had a particular way of recruiting, um, and that's worked in the past, and now it's not. Um, or they're having different types of conversations and. So um, we need to sort of think, okay, the world, you know, has shifted a bit and, and things are, are different. Um, so, you know, just understanding that, okay, we need to make a mindset shift that is different. Um, the old ways don't work. We need to try new things if they're not working. Um, and I think that there's a, a, a bit of a flip in the, in the um, who has the kind of, I wouldn't say power, it's probably too strong a word, but um, where really the emphasis is on attracting the right candidate to the organisation um you know and it's less so about the idea of well i'll interview all these people and i'll grant the one you know that i you know i we like the best the the job really it's about um you know i think as an organization working hard to attract the very best sort of um, candidates and and that's the onus is sort of on the organization to be to impress the candidates now as much as it is you know the other way and it's not something that necessarily is an easy psychological shift to make if it's not something that that uh, people have been sort of used to um then the other ways we need to sort of shift the mindset is around um hiring for potential um and so we'll often have in our mind the idea of the ideal candidate you know which essentially will normally will have you know a candidate that has you know the right experience and the right kind of background to be ready to go so a lot of the, the sort of development work um has been done uh, or the person's initial experience to get you know basic experience in the industry has been done they're ready to sort of work in in a sort of full capacity and particularly for health professionals that's that's uh, depending on um the, the the funding models and the different things that people are working under in different parts of the world but sometimes um, people need to hire you know fully registered and experienced clinicians to be eligible to you know claim um, insurance um, rebates and and uh, and uh, you know in in some countries if there's uh, universal health care to tap into that um, but we need to sort of shift our thinking a bit to and sometimes a business model to be able to think about hiring people for potential and being able you know, they might not be quite yet sort of fully baked if you like fully ready to go um but thinking about you know how can we 
perhaps support people that are earlier in their you know career and develop them and develop the skills and their confidence to then um, eventually be able to perform that that full role so it's sort of thinking about coming in a little bit earlier and sometimes that's um, need to change the business model um, to look at how to regenerate um, revenue from people that may not be yet fully registered or um, so to make the business case work but um, I think having that sort of mindset means that you often position yourself really well for the future because you're kind of developing your own future um your own future team members and we see that being done really well in lots of different places around the world and it, it makes a massive difference um and finally is that I'm idea sorry, of oh Jamie, yeah so mention on that one as well i guess when you are developing your own like you you think about the level of engagement that you get from a person the level of appreciation the level of loyalty um and i, I think even from an eternal perspective we've got some people in in a similar sense who have developed and they're in you know good senior roles now and yeah. the the level of understanding of paradigm that they have is like second to none yeah it's been i mean we've got people that have been with us for almost the start you know <laughs> that, that started at you know very at uh, you know entry level uh, even uh, traineeships and whatnot who are now you know uh, 10 years later or something you know are in you know some of the most senior uh, you know positions and um, and they've really shown themselves over that time, you know, the, you sort of really get to know them very well and they get to know the organisation very well. And, um, you know, it's a real sort of, you know, win-win. Um, the other thing too, just as, a, you know, slightly humorous but, but also true, um, you also don't get as many bad habits, right? If you want to look at positives of, of, of uh, training and, and developing, um, often you have less work, you know, in terms of undoing bad habits that they might have picked up from previous workplaces or um, and things. So often persons, you know, a little bit more uh, open to doing it in the way that um, that particular practice or organisation you, you'd like it done. And um, that has a lot of benefits, you know, often, you know, that that actually makes things more efficient and in, where, in areas where, you know, people sometimes think, oh, you know, I don't have the time to sort of develop and whatnot, but there are, you know, real advantages and um, to doing that. Um, and finally, in terms of, you know, mindset is this idea of, you know, we do need to appreciate, right, the preferences of the emerging workforce. And there, I think for all of us, particularly if being around a while and, and been employing people for, for some time, you know, there can be that internal dialogue, oh, well, you know, when I was uh, job seeking and when I was uh, in that position, I wouldn't have asked for those things or made those demands or had that expectation. You know, so sometimes we can kind of use our own past experience, you know, as an anchor point for what's reasonable and not reasonable. And therefore, when um, the emerging work workforce has different priorities and has different um, expectations from their workplace, we've got to be, I think, mentally flexible and not become resistant to that or defensive or, um, you know, upset or, you know, feeling, you know, um, you know, <laughs> Get irritated even though we've seen that happen a lot you know, where people be like ah this <laughs> why well, this person's asked for like flexible hours straight off the bat and that you know um they're brand new i wouldn't have asked for that you know so we're going to go and get past that and go okay if we want to be like an employer of the future and what we want to be someone that is attractive to the emerging workforce um we've got to make that adjustment right and we've got to work with that and use it to our advantage rather than get caught in some of the old um, mindsets that, you know, can can very easily happen and uh, often happens a bit almost sort of subconsciously. Mm. And so if you get ahead of the curve, these things are going to be the norm um, across the board in a few years, get ahead of the curve and um, build the, the working environment that is envious um, to, to other places. Yeah, I, exactly right. I think it, uh, you, you, then you're, you're miles ahead. It's like people at first, you know, opened a Twitter account, first had a Facebook, first had Instagram, like when no one else was really doing it, you know, and then it didn't take too long. That was the norm and they were the established kind of people, right? Um, it's the same thing now with, with this sort of stuff. Uh, get ahead and, um, you know, it will serve you well. Okay, let's uh, move on and look at a couple of foundational things to, um, to, to get right before we kind of jump into this kind of recruitment um, side of things, because often, you know, we can think about, okay, we just need to recruit, recruit, but um, we've got to make sure that we're stabilizing the existing workforce as well. And this is something that we we see um, in, in practices. And again, it's universal. We see this with customers um, around, around the world. And even in our own uh, practice, we've, we've had to pay attention to this from time to time. 
Um, and that is around, you know, if you're sort of focused on the recruitment side, but you're not looking after, like it sounds really basic, but we really got to think about it. If we're not thinking, if we're not looking after the, um, the needs of the existing team, what you end up with is sort of rotation out as you're recruiting. It's kind of like you've got a hole in the bucket, right? So you're trying to recruit and grow the team, but at the same time, you've got people sort of dropping off um, out of the team because, you know, sometimes because the there might be things that are important to them that we haven't kind of picked up on um, fast enough. So really just before we kind of, you know, um, as, as employers, you know, dive into that, okay, let's grow the team. We've got to just think about some of these kind of questions here about are the team, you know, happy? Um, is there a way for um, that feedback, um, you know, to be able to hear that feedback from people? And, you know, the way you do that can vary, you know, depending on the size of organisation. But um, as long as there's a way to listen and then to be able to make changes um, that, you know, will help keep people happy. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, you end up with a, yeah, trying to <laughs> fill the bucket. Um, yeah. And there's lots yeah. of ways to do that. Like it, it can be a simple like Google Form survey. Um, there's like I mean, it doesn't need to put a lot of um, resources into it. Um, and uh, just kind of asking the the simple questions. It was like um, how how effective are we as um, an employer? Um, what what do, would you like to see out of this? And I mean, there there are always the the single people remuneration is always uh, kind of on on the. On the low side, um, the people always say that, regardless of, of any circumstances. I've, I've never seen anyone saying 100%, yeah, this is great. But um, I think the thing is, is that you just need to ask the questions and then you're not necessarily going to be able to make every single change, but um, you can take take everything in, be transparent, give the results out, show people what um, what what the trends are and what you're going to prioritize. And, um, and even saying like, okay, well, we can't do this because this and like, just uh, trusting that everyone is a reasonable adult and that kind of having just that open dialogue can mean a lot to people and um, and they, they'll appreciate it. I really think so. And um, it could be, uh, yeah, as I say, surveys, uh, suggestion boxes. I think the main thing with things like that is to not just take the information and keep it. And um, it's about yeah. being transparent, putting it out there and um, don't, don't ask questions if you don't expect to act on it. So... Yeah. yeah. Uh, and did you find things don't you, like um, when you do that, that even if you've got great relationships with team members, you still find the things that are niggling and that that um, you're just not, you got maybe you're, gonna, you know, you're, you're blind to um, and because people will tell you in a different kind of, uh, different type of forum. Um, and yeah, like I said, with the re remuneration, um, it is funny how, may, how much like people might raise it, but how much also it may not be that, you know, like, or, you know, yeah. where you'll see um, just there might be themes that come out that have nothing to do with that. It could be about recognition. You know, it could be about variety. It could be about other things that you're like, yeah, actually, we can attend to that, you know. Um, and often, you know, you get really good understanding of where people, where they're thinking is that. Um, but you've also got one on here that um, you know, was around understanding the total reward, right? And this sort of taps into this idea and, you, you talk a bit about this in, internally, I know, with us here at, at Powder, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But what in a, when you're looking at um, a health practice and health recruiting, what, what comes to mind when you're thinking the total reward that, that people are receiving? I mean, um, overall, kind of from the HR point of view, total reward is referring to the that, the total package that people get from being employed at a certain place. So um, it will be like not just the money that you put in your back pocket at the end of the week or month. <laughs> it's the um, it's the experience that you get. It's the um, the relationships that you build with your colleagues. It's um, I mean it, it's also like I mean you've kind of you've got your pension insurance all that, that kind of things. But then it's it's also the learning, the development um, that um, people get, and it's it's the it's the entire package of um, what how people can be enriched by being um, employed in a certain place. And, um, and I think it, it's something that is sometimes overlooked, like being yeah. in a, a job that you love and that you love your colleagues and you, it's, a, it's a great environment um, can sometimes, you know, be more, um, be, be worth more to an individual than actual money in your back pocket. So 
um, to understand that yourselves and to even like kind of having those conversations with your employees to um, kind of highlight those areas. And, and it's, that's kind of it's all about your what you offer as an employer, your unique selling point as an employer. Um, yeah. And for a health. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah, we were discussing this. I mean, you, you can go into the specifics about it, but it's it's like when it comes to learning and development, for example, it doesn't necessarily need to be going on a course. Um, you've got this 70 20 10 model when it comes to learning, effective learning. Um, 10 percent of effective learning comes from sitting in a classroom. 20 percent will come from sitting with someone, mentoring, learning off them. Um, but 70 percent of effective learning is what you get from doing something on the day. Um, day-to-day work and yeah. um, so if you're you're doing it you're utilizing new skills and um, that's how you'll get it and like by I guess doing getting involved in different projects different areas of work within the practice doesn't need to have um, a specific monetary value next to it but um, getting that varied experience can yeah that is effective learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, just even drawing on our experience growing our, you know, our private, you know, psychology practice. So you know, it started out as my wife and I, and um, then we grew it to, you know, a fairly substantial um, team. One of the things uh, when we, you know, we were growing, we, we changed buildings um, and we were um, fitting out, you know, a, a, a new building um, for it. What we ended up doing is having this very sort of large central um, communal area where all the psychology, um, all the psychologists and admin and everything were um, in a in a you know in the middle where they could actually talk and we soundproofed the the absolute <laughs> as much as we possibly could around that so to separate that so it was a safe space people come into and they come out of the consults that come in and the interaction and relationships and things that they would develop between. Um, um, colleagues and the support that they would get from being in the same space like that, we, we found, um, you know, it was so important. And and we, you know, we think about some sort of total reward when we would ask people about why, you know, they would like you know, working, you know, with the with us. Um, that was one of the things that would come up is around the support from the colleagues. And it wasn't necessarily the formal things that we might organise, like, you know, group supervision and individual supervision, mentoring, all those things, which are important too. But it's the informal um, that would sort of factor into this idea of total reward. And if a, someone was coming from another practice where they'd worked, where they didn't have that, and then they would come um, to, to our clinic, there would be something that I'd comment on, you know, that, Ah, this is this is different. Although if we'd asked them, they wouldn't necessarily have come up with it. Um, so just trying to think about what it is, you know, and understanding that, and then leveraging those things both for retention, then of course for um, for recruitment. Very good. Thank Anything you. else you want to say on uh, on on that one, or uh, you think we've we've covered it off the key points there? Yeah, I think, uh, I suppose, you know, management, it's its a classic people leave jobs because of uh, lack of progression, lack of learning and, and poor management. Um, you know, I've uh, had had managers in the past that were progressionable and, you know, one day you love your job, the next day you don't. So but, um, the, the management themselves as well, like, especially if, you know, there's a manager saying everyone in my team is terrible. I was like, is it everyone yeah. or is it one? Yeah. So just, yeah, just exactly. things to consider. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've got anything like that happening, whether it's yourself or whether it's um, you've got a practice manager or someone in place um, and you're getting that feedback. Yeah, let, do you know, that's where you can go off and do, do a course, do some learning, develop some skills, some mentoring to address that. Because like you say, that that's a, that's a leading reason for people. Um, OK, number two. So this is back to this idea of foundation. So number one, stabilize your workforce. Number two, know your core values, mission and your vision. OK. Um, and this sort of goes to that idea of being an inspirational um, place to work. And to do that, you kind of need to sort of like define in your own mind first or uh, you know, in your own leadership group, if there's a few of you in that, about what's the practice culture that you're aiming for. Um, and, you know, describe the sort of employee kind of characteristics that are going to support that culture. So when you think about what sort of things are going to enable you to fulfill that? Um, what are the ins and outs? You know, what are the what are the things that are going to be? Yep, this is going to be um, help us get us towards that kind of goal. And these sort of characteristics are going to 
take us away from that. Um, and that's really important because then once you've got that kind of clear, it makes it a lot easier to work out what sort of people are going to be a good fit and what sort of people um, perhaps aren't going to be so good. Um, and then that, you know, means that you're going to have um, your recruiting behaviour is going to be consistent and it becomes self-perpetuating because you're, um, you've got a culture in mind, you're recruiting with that in mind, which means you're more able to fulfil it and to deliver on that, which means that you genuinely become a better place for people to uh, work and want to be a part of that. Uh, if you get it backwards and we see this, you know, it's a very easy thing to, to do. The owner or the, the principal um, driver of the practice will have some really good ideas around the practice culture and what they're aiming for, but um, the recruitment practices are not aligned. So you align and recruit people often because they feel pressure and um, we need, you know, we need thumbs on seats, we need to fill these appointments. But what happens then, of course, recruit the people that are not aligned with that culture, um, which means that the culture doesn't happen. In fact, you can sometimes get the opposite, which means that when you do recruit people that, you know, identify with that culture, well, they don't want to stay around. Um, and so you end up in this sort of vicious cycle and often people get quite frustrated with that um, and, you know, find it hard to realise what is happening that is uh, is causing that. So you know, really important to sort of really try and nail that down and write it all down so that you know exactly what it is that you're aiming for. Don't just have it in your head because it will sound, you know, clear today and uh, it will be gone tomorrow when you're recruiting and have someone, you know, then all these things will go out the window unless you have it written down. Okay, that leads us on to purpose. And, uh, yeah, what, what, yeah. Uh, you've, you've got a nice observation here. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is just a, a quote, and possibly people have heard this one before. It's it's quite a famous one that uh, JFK in, in NASA and um, yeah, speaking with the um, the guy in the corner with the um, with the broomstick and um, just the fact that that person could see what they were doing, like what like what we all do to you know put people on the moon. I'm not good. we're not going to move but yeah <laughs> um well just that we are all aligned and like if the floor was dirty if there was something happening there like that cannot nothing can happen if that floor is dirty um and that if we can all see and this goes back to the meaningfulness I suppose the thing is when you're talking about your health practice yes and um, within the general health industry you've got meaning just from the very nature of it but why would someone what's meaningful about your practice what do you want to achieve from your your vision your values and your mission and um and then how can people align their own personal values to that and um and that if everyone's pushing um in the right direction then that will you know move the boat quicker and um and yeah it, that's the main per yeah. power of purpose and yeah and so it's sort of linking isn't it like clearly defining what it is your practice is going to do what the aim is you know it might be to provide you know the um you know a, a, a health practice that is provides you know a, a comfortable environment great you know um great clinical care um and a an experience that is you know addresses uh people's anxiety about you know treating seeking treatment or whatever it might be that you want to sort of dial in on um, so if you have that sort of identified, that's what we're here to do. And then everyone's clear on that and know that's the mission. We're going to improve the health of this population or this is the experience our patients or clients are going to have. Then, yeah, people, they feel tied into that and whatever their role might be, but see how it links. Um, well, we go to the moon in figurative terms. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, very good. So um, I think when we've got those those things that are that are in place, then you know we've got the foundation right. We're ready then to sort of go to that kind of next level. Um, so let's uh, we'll go through these um, uh, fairly quickly. But you know, step one is identifying the sort of ideal um, the ideal kind of candidate. So um, you know, it might be sort of thinking about um, how you know the the kind of job is, um, uh, how you describe it, how you can sort of construct it. But when you're thinking about candidates, we're sort of thinking as creatively as we can. So when you've got a candidate, you know, given that no candidate's going to be perfect, we need a way of sort of shifting through 
and differentiating. And one of the key things that is super helpful is to think about what's teachable and what's not teachable. Um, because once you identify that, then, you know, it's if someone isn't perfect, um, but they have potential, then you can work out, well, the things that they're lacking, are these teachable things or unteachable things? If they're unteachable things and they're not aligned with the culture and with the environment that you're creating, then it's fairly clear that person perhaps isn't going to be a good fit, right? But conversely, okay, if the deficits are experience, well, you can help with that. If they're things that they just haven't yet sort of got their head around but have the great attitude to it and demonstrated that a willingness to, to learn and adapt, great. Um, then you can do you can use that and it, it's, it's helpful in terms of making recruitment decisions that might be different to what you would have recruited uh, in the past. Second thing around this is around, you know, what are your deal breakers? Um, there's going to be every organisation should have some deal breakers, things that are just, you know, uh, not acceptable, right? Or that are going to be really counter to what the aim of that practice, you know, is is um, doing. And just know by knowing those things, again, you can. If someone has um, behaviour that really is um, outside of that, um, then you can, you know, identify that easily uh, and move on, and uh, and you know, preserve the mission that that you're on. Okay, step. To crafting uh, the job advert, I'm going to hand uh, over to you, Nam, because you are you you manage that not only back when you know when you're doing allied health recruitment, whatnot, but in in powder, you're you are uh, are running uh, our job ads and trying all sorts of different things. So uh, you can lead us through this one. Yes, absolutely. Um, so when it comes as time and time again, and and what I've seen in the past is that people, you, you get your job description and, you know, your job description, quite clinical, and it's always described the job description should be your list of ingredients, a job ad that you actually put out there and trying to entice people should be the shop window. So, um, like, you don't buy a cake and go, oh, look, flour and baking soda, amazing. Like, you, you kind of go and, like, oh, what's the icing and, and all that. And, and that's that's the, the key difference, that your job ad, that's your opportunity and, and possibly your only opportunity when people are scrolling through LinkedIn, but, but, but what do I want? Um, you, you've got very few um, kind of, it, it's a short potential to get out there and reach someone. So, like, kind of thinking about the structure of it, what do you want to like, lead with? What will make you stand out from the rest of the crowd? And um, and it's promoting everything that the person will get, not just the day to day of the actual job, but what you can offer um, from the from the experience, like what what it's like to work there, what what colleagues like about it, um, and and just being able to and like you know having an underpinning of what your values are and what's important to you as a as a, as a practice, and and kind of what that person can like what they can expect from their day to day. Um, and yeah, using plain language, just like kind of being authentic, showing, kind of giving a, a little bit of, of yourself and um, putting it out there and being being vulnerable. Um, that's what, what people want to see, what kind of, what, what will it actually be like? And, and speaking of vulnerability, um, our, our engineering manager, I'm sure if you, you pop on LinkedIn to Power Diaries page, you can um, see uh, our engineering manager recently created a video just to talk about what it's like to work as an engineer. In, in in power diary and um it, he put a lot more pizzazz into it than i was expecting i, I really gotta say it um and you don't need to go to the nth degree but like sometimes just like a very short kind of video for example of kind of saying this is what we do this is why people like being here this is what we want to um achieve for our patients um like just something really quick like that and then like kind of and coming from you as in like I am the practice owner this is I will work with you every day and, and for people to get a glimpse into what that's like is um I, I really like it but yeah it's 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 hard as well you know uh. but, and, and I think this is where some of those earlier things we we're talking about um, about getting those foundations right shine through because mm -hmm. if you've got that culture it's a genuine um thing you're promoting here you know that this is what we're about and that shines through so you get people the right sort of people gravitate right to because it resonates with them that kind of message and that authenticity and realness like the people that are kind of they go that's where i want to work you know that's different it's something different than what everyone else is doing because everyone's got ads out right like so uh that's it gives you a cut through doesn't it that, that uh, your uh, other practices that you're competing with for the same people if they're not doing it they don't have that competitive edge 
Very good. Uh, okay, so uh, promoting uh, a job ad. Um, so uh, you've got some ideas around this about yeah how to kind of or promoting the job. It's not even just the ad, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess uh, you've got you've got your standards. You get it up on your your jobs boards, your seat, your LinkedIn, your Indeed. Like they're they're all out there. Um, but then it's it's also like you know similar with the way of patients go to where your audience is and think about the, the professional associations like if there's journals out there if there's sometimes they'll have um jobs boards on, on the professional associations websites um jobs boards like just literally being where where you post your jobs um and um yeah thinking about how you can yeah reach those people in where they will be on a day-to-day -day basis um when it comes to I mean, Damien, you probably know more about word Google Ads than me, but there are you, you can you know post on your own yeah. Facebook page, but you can actually target um, these audiences as well based on their own um, like, uh, profiles. Um, Absolutely, have... and, and Google like we know that um, you know Facebook and uh, Google collect a lot of information, Instagram and whatnot collect a lot of information and, and know a lot about us, right? Um, so we can utilize this to our advantage when we're recruiting because you can um, go in and say, I want to target, um, this is an ad, you know, I want to target for a health practitioner, I want to target this geographical area with this sort of type of um, person um, and have the ad shown to those target people within the area that you define. And that can be really powerful because um, it doesn't, uh, because often there is some geographical restriction to where people are recruiting from, they're recruiting in full uh, particularly if it's a primarily on-premises type role, then um, people are usually recruiting from a certain geographical um, area. Um, and you can go in and you know, with Facebook or Google and say, hey, I want to promote you know, just to these people. So it's quite cost effective because it's not sort of wasting um, impressions, you know, which you uh, pay for or wasting clicks um, on audiences that are perhaps not likely to be you know, the ones that are, are going to um, respond. So the outside the geographical region. So uh, people often don't think about doing that. We've had great success um, with that over the years in, in our own um, health practice and, and recruiting. And all of a sudden, these ads show up, and we've had other people, you know, other uh, practices say, "Hey, how did you <laughs> how did you do that?" I saw your ads targeting. Uh, it keeps popping up. Um, you know, so you can you can do that. You can also um, set it so that if someone um, was to visit your website, um, you know, maybe they have an initial inquiry, you know, about the job that you have on offer, um, then ads about working for you will keep popping up. Um, so you can uh, utilize those things to sort of stay front of mind and, um, and uh, just the way that you would market to uh, customers, you can utilize these tools in a way that's really helpful for, for um, recruiting and growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, it's, it's that, it's those little, touch points that you know seven points to make a sale seven points of contact to make a sale it's the same thing and like people might be thinking you know like we're getting slowly but surely getting towards the end of the year and you know over the holiday period and people are sitting kind of after Christmas dinner again and like oh kind of do I want to go back to that place um and then they start thinking oh god what was that ad I saw um and and hopping on um back onto the website so yeah it's it's about just kind of breadcrumbs and, and getting them out there um and yeah word of mouth um absolutely talking with your own networks you know you can obviously post things on linkedin and stuff like that but um just going out and um, talking there's yeah professional networks and and, and you know that definitely we, we find the best way that we recruit para diaries um when if someone can actually say yeah i work here i love it this is why i love it and um, that's going to resound more than you know reading an ad um yeah so and, and then that can come it can, can, can come down to even team members sharing the job ad um, on their own personal social media if they're happy to do that um, and you put it on your own personal one because let's face it, we often socialise and mix with and have, you know, in our um, networks, you know, people that are similar to us, right, uh, that have similar backgrounds, similar educational experience, whatnot. So if we promote, you know, in those kind of ways and say to the team, hey, this is a new uh, job going out, anyone wants to post it to their social, that would be great. Um, then it's getting really targeting, you know, getting the word of mouth benefit, but you're also sort of targeting the, the right sort of people. Um, and it's free and uh, often there's a connection there, you know, so like you say, it, 
it's a good uh, it's good if people come along and they've got a connection to an existing um, team member because it's uh, good all round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can consider whether you'd want to give a referral bonus. It may not necessarily um, be, be an absolute requirement, but it's a potential that kind of sweetens the deal um, for the individual. And you can put caveats into it that are like they wouldn't say pass probation and and, and things like that. So um, just something to consider, really. And um, and all of these things, it, it's about kind of being being strategic and being going beyond like putting the uh, the job out there and, and kind of sitting there and waiting for them to come back. It's how do you get ahead of the curve and, um, and be a little bit different, the approach. Exactly. And then we're stuck in here 3A. Uh, and this is, <laughs> we're going to make it a whole separate step. It's, it's a, a thing to consider. Uh, and this is based on uh, your experience uh, with this in the past as well. Uh, yes. So you want to take us through um, this? Well, How from experience, <laughs> having worked at a recruitment agency in the Allied Health space in Australia, it's possible that I've actually reached out to a number of people on this call today. Um, <laughs> and recruitment agencies, I mean, I, you know, I on a daily basis get contact from recruitment agencies now. And once you put an ad out there saying that you're recruiting, I would would be very surprised if um, you're not contacted by somebody. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's your choice what to do with this but um there is you know there there's a reason why they're there um because they, they there is benefit and it would sometimes it's it's fees can you know vary and um can seem a lot but there's also consider about okay well how much is it costing by not having someone in that role um how much would we have spent on a salary during this period um if we're like you know say for example 10 to 20 percent um, sometimes of, of fees um, would be the of the person's gross annual salary would be the fees 10 to 12, 10 to 20 percent on average though. Um, so that's what they someone, would charge is that sorry is that yeah. what they would charge so if you were say if you were employing someone a role that was let's say a hundred thousand uh, dollars or, or, or pounds or euro whatever currency you're in um, as an example so um, they might charge 10 to 15 percent of that to find yeah. someone for you so they might charge 10,000 or 15,000. So that kind of seems like a lot, right, up front. But what you're saying is if you think about these other things, really, that sort of you know, hold it, balance it up, that you could you could be losing all these billions that are worth way more than that mm -hmm. um, in, while you're waiting. Yeah, right. and if yeah. you've got a budget that you've set aside for the year and you've not had someone enrolled for 50% of the year, then, you know, 20% of that is, is of the total amount is still not, you, you've got it. You, you, you set the money aside so it is there, it exists. And um, and if it will potentially put a person in that role who could, you know, get you uh, more billings and take away time, because I guess it's it's also the time it takes to recruit, the time it takes to find someone, the time of not having someone enrolled that is eating away at what you should be doing um, as, as a practice owner and like, like kind of the various things, or if that is then encroaching on your evenings and, and just meaning that you don't have a single moment to, to get anything done. Um, there's, um, they, they do several purpose recruitment agencies. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we want to sneak it in there. It's one that I've yeah. never like to, I've never used uh, in, in um, practice. I haven't used a recruitment agency before, but I've got to say I've become I think more that I've talked to you about this over time, the more sort of I've rethought that, you know, and thought, you know, I would, I would, if I was doing it again, I would, I would probably utilize this for some, for certain positions where, mm -hmm. um, like you say, these factors um, really do sort of weigh up, um, you know, or do counterbalance that, that initial, um, that cost is perhaps not as big as it seems when you look at it in the bigger picture. Um, and they do have like, you know, caveats, don't they? You, if, um, there's a success metric that the person needs to be, you know, start work. And, you know, if, if that placement wasn't successful, um, you know, there are usually some yeah. sorts of things in the contract that allow for, you know, them to, um, you know, uh, find another person for you or do something that kind of means yeah. you haven't just done, done your, <laughs> done your dough and <laughs> found that they're not someone that, you, you know, that is a good fit. So anyway, yeah. you did put it in but there. Because, like, period. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is worth it worth considering. I know, like, uh, uh, yeah, in other contexts, you know, it's something that that people uh, use. But for allied health, worth worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we're looking at uh, then this idea of the interview process, um, and it's one uh, I'll talk a bit about because I feel quite sort of you know passionate about this. That 
you know, when it comes to this, we can, you know, the interviews and there's lots of research to say, you know, different ways you should do or shouldn't do and how effective they are and whatnot. But the reality is most people, um, essential part of the recruitment is um, the interview process, particularly in um, allied um, in health and allied because we really want to get a sense you know, of um, the person. So a few tips that we've got here that um, really, I guess, help with the effectiveness um, of this. So establish a, you know, a very sort of a structured um, recruitment process that all candidates kind of go through. Um, and so that you have different potentially interview stages um, and that you have sets of questions for each of those sort of stages. And those things are kind of written out and identified ahead of time. And um, you know you can customize some questions and add things on to focus in on particular things you want to learn about the candidate, maybe based on their earlier answers, but also want to have a standardized um, a approach so that we're not just sort of tailoring the interview on the fly to meet the need, you know, to just drill down, you know, on that one element of a person or a candidate. So for instance, there might be something we find really interesting about them. We could spend the whole interview like asking about that. And if we don't have um, a structure to it, we may miss asking really important um, uh, questions. The other side to this too is around just one of fairness, that the interview process by having that structure, and I know that's something you talked to us about, Naomi, and make sure that we all behave ourselves and we all do the right thing with our our interviewing right is to make sure that it's fair for every candidate that they have the same opportunity to answer the same sets of questions. Um, so that's a that's a big one. Um, then um, next point I think is around having a couple of opinions. Um, I think uh, particularly in smaller uh, practices, you know, there are some practices that might be very start of their growth journey, um, and there may be one sort of principal who is doing um, you know the hiring because they might be the only person at that stage. Um, I think it's still worth co-opting um, someone else to be um, involved. So ideally, if you've got um, people within the, the organisation that you can utilise, um, that's great. If not, even utilising, you know, people in your kind of social network that might have some skills to have a different, give a different perspective. And it, it's, it's very, very useful um, because we can... You know, there can be, uh, you know, certain chemistry or lack of chemistry, if you like, between one <laughs> one interviewer and one one candidate. That may be just that dynamic. Um, getting different opinions, getting other people um, to to have a look. Uh, and if you if you can't um, schedule multiple interviews, even at least record with permission, consent, of course, be transparent about it. But record um, the the interview so that it can be. Um, play to someone else for um, for um, opinion, and um, you know your second interviewer doesn't have to be someone who's going to be their manager. It can be another you know another clinician who um, you trust um, within the organisation, or another um, senior admin person. Um, you know that that you know. So think creatively about it, um, and then also have multiple touch points. So. Um, we can all have a good day and a bad day, right? You know, um, and sometimes, uh, you know, I found uh, I never used to do this in the early days of, of recruiting, and particularly when I used to work in um, in the early stage of my career, I'd work in um, in public um, health services, and um, we didn't necessarily do this. We'd have these sort of single points of where we'd have the interview, and we would base recruitment decisions, you know, um, way too much on that. Um, and what would happen is sometimes you would find that, you know, if you do a second interview, you know, it's a second time point, you get a different dimension often to um, the person. And that can be both positive, you know, you can reveal positive things or can reveal negative things. But you get at least sort of two snapshots, two different perspectives of the same picture. Um, and that's much better, I think. You, you, you end up with a, a, a found, you know, much less likely to have be surprised um, later on uh, by a characteristic that emerges that you think, where did that sort of come from? Um, and, uh, you know, as much as possible, you know, match the questions uh, or the, the tasks to real life work situations. And it sounds kind of basic, but it's amazing how often that isn't, you know, part of what happens. Um, so when you think about what are the actual skills, what are the things that are going to make this person successful, and then look at, you know, make sure the questions are actually based around that and not just the sort of generic, you know, 
tell us about your strengths and weaknesses and your past experience and whatnot. But think about questions that really drill into um, those those real life um, you know situations and ask yourself, you know, is this person demonstrating the sorts of skills, even in the interview, the sort of communication skills and things that we need um, for this particular role. Um, and then uh, we've got some um, uh, some things around behavioural based interview questions. Uh, Naomi, what 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 do we mean when we talk about behaviourally based interview questions? Um, so behaviour based, competency based um, interview questions is, is quite often what they're also called, and it, it's basically you look at be past behaviour to try and predict what future behaviour will be like. And um, so they're, they're generally these questions in the form of tell me about a time when something, something, something happened. And um, and you would expect people to give the answer in a star format, which is situation, task, action, result. And um, and quite often, like I, I've, I've stopped people in the past where they're kind of going, oh, we did this, we did that. And I'm like, no, what did you do? Um, because sometimes if you're, you know, part of a larger project, but you, you knew everything that happened, but you didn't actually do anything of it, you were there taking notes, like, um, you're not actually leading those things. So it can be quite easy to, to try and, you know, get, get lost in the crowd, but still say that you were, you know, instrumental in that. So um, definitely if people are saying we kind of like, well, what did you do? And then honing in on those things, what that person did. So the of the star, the action the A is what you want um, people to, to really um, to give the, the most detail in. Yeah. And tell them that, um, and and you know, if they start going down the wrong path, um, try and try and kind of stop them early. It's like I'm just going to let me read the question again, and and just make sure I have to really think about whether this is really answering it, um, because yeah, you you want to want to be able to help them and and kind of set them on the right path. But if it's if you're doing that too much, you know, sometimes there there could be a dead end there as well. So, um, yes, and and like that, as as Damien said, that that will having those specific questions that need to be answered and you kind of say, okay, well, we've got three questions here. We want about 10 minutes per question. And it's really just standardizing things and that uh, making sure that everyone has the opportunity to, um, to answer to, to the best ability um, in, a, in a standardized way. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say the, uh, the other points we were talking about on, on this here and the process is around um, subtly like uh, selling the practice. Um, and this is one, you know, and I can, I can understand where people get into this kind of trap um, where um, they're really, they know how much pressure there are for services, you know, how much they really want to fill this sort of spot. Um, but what can actually happen is that they can actually sound kind of come across a bit desperate. Um, and you do not want that. It's, it's just as unattractive in recruitment as it is in, date, in the dating world, right? <laughs> you don't want to sound desperate. It does not make you desirable. So, um you know, avoid that sort of temptation to be, you know, overly kind of enthusiastic about that person kind of joining and, and that they're like, you know, you know, come, we, we really need this position filled and they're, yeah. Okay. You, you got to remember, you, you, you know, you've got to kind of sell it, but don't, don't oversell it. Don't, don't reverse the dynamic too much where it's kind of like, hang on, what, what's going on here? Why are they so, you know, uh, so avoid that trap, um, and just remember, of course, that the interview goes both ways. You want to you want to make it appealing without going um, overboard. Um, yeah. You know, with that. Okay, and remember to give that person the opportunity to ask questions and to to learn about what what it is like there, because they they will have they they will want to learn about it. So that's a kind of it going both ways. That um, they're they're almost interviewing you as an employer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so looking at um, onboarding, so now let's say we've found the the right, um, uh, yeah, the right person. Now we need to kind of bring them um, onto the you know onto the team and get them kind of all all set up. Um, you know, I think the we've got to make sure here that um, we just got to cover off on the legal basics, um, and it, it you know it's something that. Um, you know, it's very easy to sort of uh, overlook, <laughs> but, you know, looking at whether, so, you know, making sure, say, do you have the right, um, you know, have a checklist there, right? So to make sure that you've got a contract in place, you're ticking off on registration requirements, you're making sure you're identifying things about like patient ownership, who owns the patients in the, in the relationship? Um, are there any kind of conflicts of interest? Are there any behaviours that you don't want them doing um, while they're engaged with you? So if there are limitations on them to make that 
kind of very clear. In other words, they can't maybe work at the practice next door at the same time as working for you. If there's anything like that, then that needs to be articulated. Um, covering off um, the contract on ownership of intellectual property um, and then any, you know, post-employment um, restrictions. Now, that can be a tricky area from a legal point of view, but um, being just mindful that if there are things that are relevant um, to uh, to that, you know, when someone leaves, maybe what they are not allowed to do, it may be they're not allowed to contact the patients and try and siphon patients across to their, to their business. Um, covering off on these things really prevents a lot of issues down the track. Um, it's something we get a lot of insight um, into from a power perspective because, um, you know, unfortunately too frequently we are, um, you know, having to sort of assist, you know, people that are negotiating um, issues post-employment or post-partnership uh, breakup, like a, a practice partnership, maybe um, people are going their separate ways. And if, the con if they don't have the expectations clearly identified, then there becomes issues around, well, who owns the patients, you know? And so someone, you know, might contact us and, you know, ask us to do, um, you know, a, a data export or to copy data into a new account to, um, enable this sort of uh, a splitting of, of the business or a, a change. Now, we have very kind of strict processes on, on our side to make sure that the um, that it is truly the, the person who owns the account with us that, that really has the say over, you know, and we only have to do something with their authorization. But the number of inquiries that come up about that often, you know, when it, it stems back to these basics not being attended to in the first place. Uh, and people, it's very stressful when it's at the end of the um, a relationship and people are um, dealing with these things. So we just want to put that in there to remember the, the legal basics. You can find some templates around online. We can't specifically recommend, you know, one because of course it's a legal um, issue and we, you know, we can't give legal advice. So we're just reminding to say, to consider this um, for, you know, a relatively small amount of money, you can, um, you know, see a, a lawyer or employment um, specialist get something kind of drafted up or modified, um, you know, for you. When I say relatively little amount of money, if you spend, you know, a few hundred or a thousand dollars or even a couple of thousand to get something put together, it saves you at the end, you know. So <laughs> get it right in the first place um, and it certainly makes, you know, a big, um, a big difference. And then the rest of the onboarding, okay, so this is the more, like, fun part of it here. <laughs> um, but you know, then we can kind of get on to making sure the experience for that new person is good. And uh, I mean, I think you, you, this is something that you're really, uh, uh, really uh, across for how we manage things with Power and we're constantly working on improving our onboarding processes. Um, so, what are the key things here for people to keep an eye out for? Do you think? Well, I mean, having a standardised checklist um, for like. You've got one for everybody that, like, you know, will just cut off, cut off all those housekeeping admin things, um, like tax file, super, all that good stuff, um, pension uh, for other countries. Um, and um, and then, yeah, there will be specific things for each. I suppose you've got your, your admin onboarding and then you've got your um, specialty area onboarding and kind of what learning they do need to do. Make sure you're just setting those up, setting those meetings up so that they come in on their first day and it looks like, structured and that they've got something really specific to go into and I know recently on our onboarding that we've had feedback and of people have gone on like you know you start somewhere else and you kind of just like people are like oh yeah what do I do with you but when we can go in and say look at this is what you're going to do this is what you're meeting this is what our expectations are for your first week for your first 30 days 60 90 and um, they like that structure um, and and it's we've definitely had that people do enjoy it um when it comes to start dates I guess it's um making sure that people like there there could be things like registration obviously that they um can take time but um people sometimes need a break in between contracts and and um and just to, to get some headspace to shut off on one and be able to uh, go in the in the next one so um kind of setting those things realistically so that it's it's a win-win for everybody um and yeah recruitment and onboarding it doesn't just stop after day one it's like kind of getting the person in getting them set up for new objectives what are they going to achieve what do they want to learn and 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 then having them kind of it that's when the employee relationship starts and um and that it's it's ongoing support of that person and as opposed to just you know get get on and, and do your work um 
and um and, and thinking about the how do you in, induct that person and, and how do you um kind of have them being uh, kind of within that the environment of employment like and, and how do you uh, get them help them forge your relationships with their colleagues especially if someone is remote and they're, they're not necessarily going to have the old inverted commas water cooler conversations um how can you help that person to to forge relationships in, internally which um again will kind of help them to to be part of the the organization and to to build that engagement to build that loyalty yeah um, absolutely and uh get them to say uh just even simple things like hello to everyone and uh get everyone to say hello to them <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing yeah yeah. Look, uh, that's that's uh, great. And we have some um, resources which we will um, will link uh, in. Uh, I think we'll, we'll send out a copy of um, the webinar to to anyone who has subscribed, and we'll put some um, links into the practice manual. So uh, within Power Diary, for those who may not be familiar, but within Power Diary, we have a built-in practice manual that has lots and lots of policies and procedures um, that are there that you can actually utilize and, and modify. Um, and we have ones, you know, even when we're looking at the things we're talking about today, we've got things that cover like team conduct, um, you know, customer service administration, um, the uh, support development, a whole bunch of them pre-written that you can utilize that can then assist with how you um, how you structure, how you onboard, how you set expectations, and how you communicate those things. So that's in the practice manual. But we'll we'll put some links through um, when we send out uh, this this webinar. And so with all those things done, you are now ready to go and hook uh, the the right candidate. Um, I think you know, like like uh, everything, um, whenever we're talking about ideas, just you know um, start. May, you know, if you can see some things there that you think, oh, we can try that, just start simple, um, you know, simply and, and you know, add one or two things and, and slowly work on improving this area. You know, um, it's, it's not something that people can, uh, you know, we can never get it right, you know, overnight. It's a constant sort of evolution, constant sort of looking and trying something, seeing what works and, and tweaking it. Um, and certainly what we um, continue, you know, to do at the, at, at the um, at the practice, but it, it powered our on a, on a on a bigger scale too. We're um, always looking at you know how what what we can do differently and how we can improve what we do. So don't um, if you feel sometimes you, some people can feel a little like overwhelmed and go oh I've got to you know change so much. So just start with something small, um, try it out, see what happens, and then add something else. Uh, anything else you wanted to uh, to add though, me before we finish up and say goodbye to everyone? No, um, not to, I, I think you probably covered everything, and and, and that's it. It's, it's starting small. It's piecemeal, and like in in the software um, terms, it's like your minimum viable product, and um, and you know get get something out that it makes a difference, and and, and keep going from there. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, <laughs> Naomi, for sharing your expertise uh, with us uh today that's been wonderful to have uh, your input in putting this together and and uh, being on to talk to everyone so thank you everyone for for joining of course if there are any questions anything we can help you with um if you go to, you can contact us you know go to our website um, or you contact our team on live chat or um via support um so we're here to help and uh, hopefully you've got some things you can take away and uh, help you on your recruitment and growth journey Great. bye for now Thank you, bye.